Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Pablo and Allison for our inviting, and the organizing committee for inviting me to come here and speak with you. Uh, I'm always excited to be sharing what CMHC does. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to make, uh, have you guys realize that, you know, partnership is key. You know, how this, you know, this conference got together was through partnership. And, you know, I think we, you know, as an organization or as an industry, we tend to work in our little silos. And when you're thinking about community, you have to look at all the key players that are, that are involved. And it's not just the municipality, and it's not just the builders or the developers. It's also the homeowners. It's also you guys, the public health, because there is that correlation and that integration uh, in terms of physical activity, uh, your community, what your community does, right? Because, you know, if you live in a community where, you know, the only thing you need to, you have to do is get a car, well, that's basically what your lifestyle will be, you know, getting car and driving point A to point B and so on. But if you live in a different community where it encourages this uh, walk, uh, walking and pedestrian and cycling and so on, then you're more adapt to be following what that community does. So uh, just before I begin, I just want to tell you a little bit about what CMHC does. So housing finance, I'm sure you guys are familiar with us from that side where if you need a mortgage, typically you would come to CMHC if you can't put more than 20% uh, down. But we also have a community development side. And they work with uh, various, uh, various groups and organizations to uh, build affordable housing units. Uh, we have an international department where they work with manufacturers and suppliers to export Canadian products and services overseas. And the department that I'm in, which is the Research and Information Transfer, uh, we have done extensive research on housing and anything related to housing. So on the one hand, we have the social economic aspect where we look at how do we house seniors, how do we improve uh, housing conditions on First Nation Reserve, uh, how do you clean up mold, issues on radon. Uh, we also look at best practices on how do you build uh, energy efficient homes. So we have a wide gamut of information which is, uh, which is available for you guys to use. It's all on our website. So uh, please visit our website to find out any information you need to know. So in 2009, we started this initiative called Eclim Communities. And basically, we partnered up with Natural Resources Canada. And we, it's a joint initiative. And basically, we were looking at providing $4.2 million for these demonstration projects. Uh, some of the speakers talked about, you know, policies and regulations and developing those. What we found from our experience is if we have demonstration projects out there, then people are able to see these projects because we're all very visual uh, creatures. So we want to see these projects and how they work and how, you know, how does people function in that. So for us, we wanted these demonstration projects that people could, you know, live in and see and, and take best, um, best practices from, uh, from these projects. So we partnered up and we provide uh, $4.2 million in technical as assistance. So basically the builders, it's their project, it's their money, and we're only providing uh, a small amount of money in terms of the research so that we can document what they're doing and then share it with, uh, with the rest of the communities. So our fundings, we provide uh, funding and support to the developers to improve performance and design and development of their sustainable communities uh, and also to demonstrate how the neighborhood scale offers unique opportunities for integration across uh, systems and we want to measure and showcase them. So our whole intent is, you know, we could set up these policies and regulations, but if we give them to the builders or developers, at the end of the day, they're going to come back and say, well, what is it in it for me? How am I going to make my money? So for us, we wanted them, we identified criteria which they had to uh, include in their project, but we want them to give us what they're going to design. So it's really their projects, and they're just looking at how do they, how do they improve their projects. So there's six theme under our uh, request for proposal. And so the first theme is on energy. So we look at uh, an energy efficient community that balances energy supply and use to minimize greenhouse gas. So one of the requirements that we had them do is we had to, we asked them to look at their existing uh, buildings or the buildings that they're planning on putting in and coming up with a model of what their energy consumption is. And then the second part is how are they gonna reduce that energy consumption? And then the, and the third indicator is how are they going to uh, integrate a community heating, uh, heating system into, uh, into their development project. So if you guys go to the poll, um, 
The question is, what is the distance a person is willing to walk to their daily destinations, such as grocery stores, cafe, uh, coffee shops, schools? 500 meters, 800? Wait a what is it that we're going to walk? Yes. Or generally? In generally, the average person. But you could base it on what you're willing to walk. <laughs> Okay, so people were actually the highest pulled is one kilometers. You must be listening to uh, Paul's uh, Young's presentation this morning. Well, the second theme is the land use and housing. And basically, it's a compact community with a balanced mix of activities, housing choices, commercial, institutional, recreational. So the, one, uh, the next indicator is housing affordability. So we asked the builder developer to provide us with the percentage of dwelling units that had uh, the price or the rent that's either equal to or below the market value of that neighborhood. Uh, the second is the land use diversity, and some of the speakers spoke to this about uh, this morning in terms of mixed use, so integrating uh, you know, your mix of uh, different types of units, so whether they're apartments, townhouses, single family, uh, in addition with the commercial spaces, and proximity of daily destinations. Well, we found that people on average would walk 800 meters to their daily destination. Anything further than that, they'll tend to get into the car. Now, I did a little road trip here, and I've, I mapped out the mileage. So you guys know where all the, the Holiday Inn is? And you know where the uh, Canadian Tire is? Well, that's exactly one kilometer. Who would walk from the Holiday Inn to the, uh, to the Canadian Tire? Very, yeah. So it's, it's always iffy, right? So we found that if it's about 800 meters, then most people will tend to walk to their daily, uh, daily destinations. Uh, the third theme is transportation, a community that reduces fossil fuel from uh, use from personal vehicle travel and provides opportunity for energy efficiency. Uh, we looked at uh, transit density. So the more uh, we look at the percentage of occupant and job within a certain area, and if there is a high number, then it can support transit service. Uh, the second thing is the proximity to transit access. So we also look at, we also ask them to identify uh, the percentage of jobs and uh, occupants that's within a certain distance to transit. So we realize that if uh, you're within a 400 meter walk to a transit service, people will tend to use that. And if you're within an 800 meter walk to uh, you know, commuter rail and so on, then that's sort of the ideal range. And the other thing that the uh, builder developer also had to include in their project is uh, their network, uh, network for pedestrian and cyclists uh, off-road uh, through path and so on. And so, you know, for that, um, we're also looking at, you know, what percentage of green space are they incorporating into their, uh, their community uh, for pedestrian travel. The fourth theme is water, wastewater, and storm water. So we're looking at a community that minimizes the use and disposal of water and negative impacts on the watershed. Uh, I believe we saw some pictures today where, you know, the first thing that builders do is they come in, they strip the land, the first thing that they put in is the road and the sewers, and then they put the houses after that, and then they'll plant, you know, the tree and, and wherever they can. So what we wanted to do is we want to reduce the on-site storm water infiltration, so uh, the Builders and developers have put in proposal for, let's say, green roofs, permeable pavements, uh, different ways to look at how do you manage that storm water instead of putting everything into uh, a main sewer system. Potable water use uh, reduction. So we're looking at energy efficient uh, appliances and toilets. We're also looking at gray water system, rainwater harvesting, low maintenance lawn, uh, zero scaping. So that was part of the criteria for, for the builders. And of course, watershed protection. The, uh, the fifth theme, and this is all in a community scale. Uh, so the fifth theme that they had to include was the natural environment. And so they had to identify the percentage of tree canopy within that neighborhood, uh, as well as natural habitat protected. So I believe uh, Randy mentioned today in terms of, you know, 
development, um, you know, increasing and stuff like that, and the pressure of development. Well, we've seen in other communities, uh, such as the, you know, greater Toronto area in Ottawa, where they issued a green belt. And what happens is, okay, so they say, well, you we can't build anything in this green belt. But what developers have done is they hopped over the green belt and started building there. So you're, you know, increasing your urban sprawl, which was basically, you know, defeats the whole purpose of having that green belt where they wanted that densification within that city area. So, you know, how do we protect our natural habitat? Uh, if the project was built on agricultural land, what percentage of that agricultural land is being protected? So you guys have lots of uh, natural habitat here, and, you know, yes, you can't really stop development, but how do you work with the builders and the municipalities to protect this habitat, that you're not losing it? And access to locally produced food, so they had to identify what percentage of the per dwelling is allocated to locally produced food. And the last theme is the financial viability. So a, mark, a marketable community that, through its design, operation, integration, and financing, is economically viable over the long term. So that's sort of the key word, is economically viable over the long term. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, if builders or developers are coming in doing this, they want to be able to make a profit. They're not going to do it and, you know, lose money. So if you only have an X amount of parcel land that they can develop on, but you want to inc incorporate this green space and the trails and stuff like that, how do you do that, that they're still making money, but then you're still getting, you know, this green space and, and everything else that you want? So there is that partnership. You need to work together in order to, you know, have benefits for both parties. So the selection process, so we issued a request for submissions. This was in 2009. We received 44 submissions, and the projects were selected by an external committee of uh, experts in the six themes. So this is where, you know, we're looking at partnership and, you know, having the integration of, you know, different key players uh, to, to evaluate these projects. And today there was announcements of four of the projects. Uh, the first one is Station Point in Edmonton. And basically, this is a renewal project on an industrial land site. And they're looking at putting in 220 affordable housing units as well as some commercial, uh, commercial and retail properties. So their proposed project, they're within walking distance to the LRT, so light rail transit. Uh, they're looking at reducing their energy, um, building energy, by 75%. They're treating 100% of their wastewater on site for reusing toilets and irrigation. And that's something that we need to look at is, you know, water is such a huge issue. And, you know, we're, you know, our fresh water is declining. So how do we, you know, use or reuse gray water for irrigation and toilet flushing? We don't need fresh water for those things. So they're looking at treating 100% of their wastewater. And they're looking at uh, diverting 100% of their storm water from the, from the sewer system. So that's huge. And because they're integrating all these uh, uh, energy efficient and renewable system in there, they're also looking at, you know, creating a green loan program. So, you know, yes, there's a huge capital cost for them up front to make this community and, you know, a livable community, but how do they offset that so then anybody could go into this project and be able to afford, uh, afford that? So that's part of the market viability issue. The second project is Ampersand in Ottawa. So this is just located west of Ottawa. And they're looking at about 1,000, I believe it's 1,000 homes and about 25,000 square meters of commercial retail space. So as you can see, you know, it's a huge development project, but you can see, like, the amount of green space that's in the project. And so they're looking at putting in a district energy system, uh, permeable, permeable pavements, green roofs, rainwa uh, rainwater recovery, high-level pedestrian connectivity. So they're incorporating the bike path and walking trails uh, within their development project. Uh, they're also including home-scale food growing, and 30% of their project will be tree canopy. So that is huge. Uh, some municipalities might allocate about 5% for green space uh, as part of their bylaw, but they're looking at 30%. And they're also incorporating a green financing option. The uh, third uh, project is Regent Park Revitalization, and this is actually an interesting project. Uh, it used to be a, it used to be a social, uh, social housing project with high crimes, prostitution, drugs, uh, and, 
just the way the project was designed. So what the developer has decided to do was he identified uh, six phases, and he went into phase one, basically moved the people that were in there out to either other areas within Toronto or at, you know, to the other parts of the other phases, demolished all the buildings in that phase one, and rebuilt it, uh, incorporating you know, market condos with affordable housing units, commercial retail space. And so we know that once you incorporate this you know, your commercial retail space, people will tend to walk there, right? You know, it's, you know, it gets back to, you know, how far do you need to walk to get your groceries and so on. So he did that in phase one, which is completed. And when, and then he moved people back in there. So now he's working on phase two. So similar process. And this is a way that, you know, if you have certain areas that are high crime, there's a way of integrating that into your community to reduce that. So the features, uh, the project features, they're looking at 40 to 50 percent lower than the building uh, modeling energy code. Uh, they're looking also at a community energy system, green roofs, uh, low flow fixtures, and they're also implementing a education for the residents. So, you know, they're building these high energy efficient homes or condos and stuff like that, but they're also uh, looking at implementing an education program for the residents to, you know, best utilize all these features. And the last project is Tai Hisdenis near Tofino, BC. So this is actually a First Nation development project. Uh, they're looking at about 200 units. Uh, 12 of those units would be for, the, for their elders. And so how they base their development project is uh, they, you know, they've identified like a community core center, multi-building school, health clinics, and so on. And then they kind of developed their housing, you know, around this core center. So... Uh, they're looking at 50% reduction in their greenhouse gas. They're incorporating a community energy system. And they're also keeping 40% of their land undisturbed. So that is, you know, huge where, you know, they're still getting their density, but they're also keeping the natural habitat. So for more information, you could visit the EcoAction uh, website uh, to get more information on these projects. And as I mentioned, as the project starts uh, being developed, then we'll start coming up with information in terms of what they've done. And there is that connectivity with, you know, the builders and the occupants. So it's something to think about. And you guys are in a best position right now because you guys are developing so much that, you know, it's worth it to, you know, go into the projects that haven't begun yet and say, well, you know what, wait, take a step back and see how you can implement some of these features in the project because these communities will be with you for the next 100 years. So, you know, it's how do you guys want to, uh, you know, how do you guys want to plan your community and what do you guys want out of it? So for new projects, this is a perfect time for you guys to get involved. Thank you very much.